to Association for Commuter Transportation's August 6th webinar, uh, our Valley of the Sun chapter. And I'm Chris Parker, uh, Vice President of our Valley of the Sun uh, board chapter. And it's a pleasure to have all of you join us this morning. Uh, we are gonna be discussing uh, the future of smart city planning and design. Uh, and today's webinar is an interactive session. So uh, we encourage you if you have questions to feel free to post those questions to the Zoom chat window, and we'll do our best to make sure that we field all those questions uh, throughout the course of today's discussion. Uh, with that, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to today's guest. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, City Gilbert, City Councilwoman, and CEO of Y2K Engineering, uh, Young Kaprowski, who is going to kindly walk us through her thoughts about smart city design and planning. And I'd like to welcome you, Young, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you this morning. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I'm happy to be here today. And again, just want to give my thoughts on the smart city planning and design. For today's presentation, I have a couple of questions for the audience as well. So if you'd like to participate, if you look at the top of the screen, um, to participate, you'll want to open a web browser or go onto your phone and go to www.menti.com and use the code 796530. Then you can participate live with some of the questions that I have coming up. And Chris, if you could actually um, copy that and type it into the chat so that people can see it if they join. Absolutely. Thank you. So a little bit about myself is um, I have two wonderful children. They're pictured here on the right, uh, Chase, who's almost eight, and Charlotte, who is almost six. They're starting third and fourth, or third and first grade this week. Um, and then my husband, Keith Kaprowski, is a huge supporter of mine and my partner in life. He's also a civil engineer. And we, this is a picture of us um, going to lecture to the ASU civil engineering class. And then the bottom left picture is me in a traffic signal cabinet installing roadside devices. Um, I have been working in transportation engineering for 13 years in the Phoenix metro area and Arizona. I started my own company, Y2K Engineering, about three years ago primarily to have uh, some more flexibility in my life and to really be able to pick the projects that I love, which are really focused around safety and multimodal transportation and smart cities. So my technical expertise in the smart city realm is primarily in intelligent transportation systems and helping to improve vehicular travel on our roadways. So I've worked on adaptive signal systems in Mesa and um, in the Northwest Valley of Arizona. I've worked on emerging technologies right now, working um, with different vendors and a, a community to install a, a system that actually uses machine learning to set signal timing. I've worked with different jurisdictions as well, installing Bluetooth and Wi-Fi travel time systems. And this kind of goes along with big data and using data analytics to respond to incidents um, and other traffic concerns. Right now, you probably are hearing a lot about broadband internet, 5G. We're, we're working with um, some vendors on signal redesign so that they can install their 5G antennas. And then I'm also very passionate about transportation safety. So we do a lot with data analytics. Recently have connected police databases directly with analytics platforms and dashboards so that communities can better know what's happening and be able to respond more, quick, uh, more quickly. And then as Chris mentioned in my introduction, I'm also a council member for the town of Gilbert. This is a recent appointment. I was just appointed in May of this year and I applied for this position um, because there was a transportation bond coming up in Gilbert and I felt that it was really important to get involved in my community. So enough about me. 
I want to learn a little bit about you guys and the people that are on this webinar. So if you could participate with me and go to thementee.com and type in the code and provide your answer to this question, what best describes your profession or role? Hopefully you can see this a little bit better in your uh, browser, but talking about public agency planner or engineer, are you a consultant planner or engineer, architect, contractor, um, are you in management or policy? We'll give it a couple moments here. All right, so it seems like everyone has answered that is participating and it looks like we have people from across the board, which is great. Um, again, if you have any questions, put them into the Zoom question box or chat and Chris will help facilitate that during my presentation. Thank you for answering this. So today's topics, I'm gonna to talk about what is a smart city talk a little bit about big data, active transportation, and then what we're seeing with some of the COVID-19 disruptions and some predictions on uh, for the future. So the next question that I'd like to know from you all is what comes to mind when you hear the term smart city? You can input up to three answers and they'll just pop up on the screen here for everyone to see. We see sustainability coming up and that is spot on in terms of trying to curb some environmental impacts, um, quality of life, technology, computers, and data. Equity, equitable, that's a great one. That certainly has to be kept in mind at, at, at all times. I know when I think about smart city, sometimes you, or when you look up the images on Google, all you see are big cities with tall buildings and just lots of technology and connection. But I think you guys are spot on in terms of the sustainability aspect, um, the data, and then the equity. So the term smart city is actually really ambiguous. There's no academic consensus onto the meaning of the term, and there's over 36 um, different definitions that, that you'll find, but something that's kind of floating to the top um, is the Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology definition, which defines smart cities as integrating data and digital technologies into a strategic approach to, to sustainability citizen well-being and economic development. So when we talk about smart cities, we have to recognize that when we implement anything for a smart city, we wanna be solving problems. And every city is gonna have different problems. That mega city with tall buildings, you know, maybe their, their issue is more environmental or congestion related with their traffic. But then there are rural communities that, that may have different issues with workforce retainment. So solving problems and figuring out what's the problem trying to address? Why is it needed? What are we doing today? And it, why is today's method not good enough? So stakeholders need to focus on, on understanding the problems that need to be addressed before attempting to embrace different policies or practices around smart cities. 
And then I think number one, smart cities have to be people focused. A lot of times, especially in transportation, I hear um, everything being very car centric and solutions and technologies about vehicles, but we need to recognize that it's not about people in cars, it's about people in general um, and, 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 and helping them um, in their daily lives and have a good quality of life. So there's actually been a lot of well-meaning smart city initiatives that have failed because they haven't engaged with stakeholders. One of these examples is Alphabet Sidewalk Labs in Toronto. So rather than connecting on connected infrastructure, we need to start connecting on the people-oriented outcomes because we need to let the community members know what's in it for them. They're not gonna trust a black box approach. And then of course, smart cities are all about innovation and that's where that technology and data piece comes from. But it's not just innovation in that technology and data, it's also innovation in management and, and running our organizations, whether they're public or private and the public private partnerships. Leaders have to collaborate across boundaries and recognize that um, policy innovation um, you know, has to be there to enable an environment for policy experimentation and collaboration and those partnerships that are so important. One recognition is that we don't want to just install technology just because we have it or because we can. Um, it, it, technology itself is not a solution. It enables us to solve the problem and improve our service delivery. So one of the key messages that I want to provide you today is just with smart cities, we need to understand that cities should not focus just on innovation and technology for its own sake, but really leverage that innovation and technology to improve community outcomes. And that's what we're going to see moving into the future as we start getting um, more embracement of smart cities from our community members. There are really four types of smart city regions that are emerging. And as I mentioned before, there's, there's some of the tech oriented communities like San Francisco and Seattle. They're economically driven by technical in, in, innovations. Their challenges are around um, high cost of living and affordability. And then we have some of the economic revival cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh and they're reinventing their regional economies. So they are leveraging smart cities to encourage economic development and help more with workforce development. Then there's some growth communities, probably like we see here um, in the Southwest, where, such as um, Denver and Houston, where we're growing economically and spatially. And um, they're focused on managing construction and really funding the new infrastructure that is needed for all of the influx of people that we have. And then there's the small and rural communities that are really making investments um, in placemaking and amenities so that residents want to stay and not move away. So I'm a huge supporter of in transportation having a holistic approach and um, making sure that we are just focusing on any one transportation mode during our planning and implementation. And I think that's a real key towards sustainability um, in, in, in balancing the transportation system congestion, environment, environmental impacts, and travel demand. We have to recognize that just intelligent transportation systems, we might reduce congestion for a little while or improve air quality a little bit, but unless we're actually shifting those modes to transit, walking, bicycling, it's not going to be as significant of an impact. And honestly, I, I, I think it's easier to try to do a mode shift than sometimes um, testing out and building all of the technology for cars. So what we're seeing in smart cities is this acknowledgement that we're generating a lot of transportation data, but we need to, uh, and that data is, is, is generated by the public sector, the private sector, by pedestrians walking with their cell phones. So we're getting a lot of good data in transportation, but we need to start using that data so that we can improve 
public transit and the physically active tr transportation modes. And for me also as shown on the screen, health is a, is a big component of this and that lends to the quality of life. I'm seeing a lot of this now in using transportation data for transportation safety evaluation, for prioritization of capital improvements, and then even in safe routes to school planning, we're seeing a lot of great data being used and collaboration between agencies to help with those decisions. And then we also recognize that the future is integrated. You know, people want instant gratification and they want everything to connect to, to, each, to each other. They don't care whether they're taking the bus or Uber or Lyft. Um, they want to know how to get from one place to another. We're seeing uh, mobility as a service rising in the transit space, linking public transit, car sharing, and then even taxi and bike and scooter sharing as well. People want to get to a um, get to a single point and then just an end to end digital app solution. And then we're also seeing dynamic routing where maybe people live a little bit farther from a transit center, but they could take Uber or Lyft to a commuter rail or light rail and then use that for the rest of their way. So have knowing what their options are to get them really out of that single occupancy vehicle. So on to big data. You know, big data just really essentially means that we're just collecting so much data in certain spaces that it takes really um, sophisticated algorithms to analyze that data. And this data is coming from, as, as I mentioned before, public sources, private sources, um, private sources primarily coming from apps and companies that have apps on people's phones, freight, uh, all of the trucking or organizations are working with different uh, data collection companies. And then on the public side, you know, public agencies are very data rich because they might have their infrastructure in, uh, instrumented or even at the MPO planning level. They have uh, various levels of not only transportation data, but demographic data. And so now with these new big data analytics, we can really start cross-referencing the different data sets and come up with some meaningful um, information. However, we have some public policy concerns. For, for example, the project that I showed earlier about um, installing Bluetooth and Wi-Fi devices in, in Mesa, Tempe, and, and Gilbert to get travel times, there was big concerns because that is um, essentially connecting to people's cell phones, but that, a data, or that data was anonymized um, to protect that privacy concerns. Young, can I, uh, just a question on that yes. point. Uh, you sit at an interesting intersection between design, plan, build on one part of your life and public policy on the other. How do you balance those two things out when you're looking to advance some of these smart city initiatives that you've mentioned so far? Yeah, so I think currently what has been implemented, especially in areas that I've seen, have been implemented under existing policy. So there was no policy to, I guess, stop them uh, from implementing certain technology. But then, we're, then we see governments, when they were surprised by the bike and scooter share, because it was a technology that they did not know could exist, was coming, and they all, all of a sudden got these devices dropped in their right of way and had to quickly rebound and uh, accommodate that through policy and regulation. And then we're also seeing, you know, the space of autonomous vehicles and having to create policy prior to that coming on board because it, it, um, it wasn't allowed before in any realm. And so what we're going to see is kind of a back and forth. It's, it, it's going to be an iterative process where we have some things that have been installed now that you know don't require any policy changes but as we go into more artificial intelligence as we collect more and more data we're, we're going to need to understand and have an approach from a public agency side of things to at least know how to respond when we get those requests from the private side and we also need to 
have collaboration with other peer agencies because no one agency should be working in a silo. I think we're going to see a lot more either um, just shared resources or, or organizations that are kind of based around collaboration around this space, but on the public agency side of, of things because they can trust one another, whereas sometimes they can get inundated with some of the private vendors trying to sell them a product. Um, so I think that's what we're gonna see. And, and policy right now e either doesn't exist and, and may need to be created, but there's gonna be some concerns as we move forward, as we saw with some of the failures of smart cities. Um, and then cybersecurity, I mean, that's, that, that's a big deal. Just in the past couple of weeks, Garmin, um, you know, had an issue and that's a huge company and affects a lot of different people. So public agencies have to be careful with that as well and disclose any standards or, or policies that are, or that may come up. And then data from a public, public agency is subject to public records requests. So that data um, is a challenge in terms of having, like trying to protect the privacy of the residents or even the trade agreements of their private partners. Um, and so public agencies will, will still need to comply with that public records request um, but we'll need to anonymize and remove any personal identifiable data. And I think the, the best approach and best practice right now is the open data initiative is to essentially just whatever data is available, put it in a format that is acceptable for, for public consumption and then just have it available for residents. And then that, that transparency among how that data is used and how it's not abused because what needs to happen is that trust can't be lost or it has to be built um, um, from the residents. And then the ethical regulation of machine intelligence. I was telling you earlier about how I was working with a, a company that's using machine intelligence to implement traffic signal timing. And we have to recognize that these algorithms might over target certain groups of people or, or, or exclude other people. So for example, if we're talking about signal timing and the algorithm is only looking at cars, well, that's not going to be very helpful because we have pedestrians and bicyclists that are using our roadways as well. So we need to recognize that, that equity side of things to make sure that we aren't biased in any way. On a related note, one other question. Um, how, what do you, how are you seeing pilot projects as a means to figure out how to scale some of the collection of big data to the deployment of things like autonomous transportation or ITS projects? Where, where do you see the progress of those pilots being a starting point to a broader type of deployment service? Yeah, I think pilots are a great way to introduce smart city technologies, but they also have to recognize and, and plan for scale early on because that's where things can really lose steam and we see a ton of pilot projects and then they just don't move forward or they don't ever expand. They just they're like, oh, we did the pilot and that was the end of the road. There needs to be a greater vision in terms of again, that outcome for the community, what is, um, what's the purpose, what's the benefit, and then how can it be scaled in, in different ways. So on my next slide, this is one example of a pilot that actually did scale. So our pilot is actually shown in the little circles um, on, the, on the reddish um, area, which is the city of Mesa. So they had a pilot to deploy some sensors on their roadways and then because it was working well and they wanted to have greater regional collaboration, they expanded the pilot to their neighboring communities to have these sensors in place. And this really helped with um, operating traffic across jurisdictions. So again, knowing your problem that you're going to solve and then having plan and support and the end game being that, that, that initiative is going to be scaled, I think is really important, but that pilot is certainly 
that first step and being transparent with the community because sometimes we might hide behind pilots as, oh, it's just a pilot. We're going to take it away if it doesn't work. But we need to recognize that the pilot is a first step to something bigger and be transparent with the community on what is the benefit to them, how it's helping them in their everyday lives and, and improving the quality of life or even the bigger picture of the environmental sustainability picture. To that point, Young, do you have advice on how organizations can finance and communicate and do all the, the major things that are important to transition from that pilot to a broader deployment? Because it, it often sounds like financing and public policy approval and community support are the linchpins to how well that pilot can transition. Any advice on how, how best to go about that? Well, I think certain projects come from a staff person in, in an agency and then are kind of pushed up. And, and maybe that's from a private vendor. But I think what we're going to be seeing coming in actual smart city implementation is we need more of that top-down approach where the manager or the leaders of an or organization see and understand the importance of, a, of the city of the future that integrates that smart city technology. So I think we're going to need to see that before we see really wide-scale uh, deployment. And again, we have to work across silos. If it just starts in transportation planning or engineering, it has to get out into economic development. It has to kind of reach um, more of a community-wide census. For example, the winner of the USDOT Smart City Challenge was Columbus, Ohio, and their solution actually addressed infant mortality rates where certain populations in certain neighborhoods didn't have access to proper health care. So again, we have to think really like bigger picture. We're not solving small problems. We're, we're, we're trying to find um, certain issues and then use data or information to help bridge those problems and find solutions. And so those solutions involve finding those communities in greatest need and then helping them connect better through technology with the healthcare that they needed to reduce those infant mortality rates. So again, that like that takes partnerships with hundreds of different or, or organizations um, that don't normally, you know, work together. They aren't under the same roof. So that's, I think, a really important part of smart cities. Very good. Let's see. So this slide is just is an example of using big data for transportation planning. The Maricopa Association of Governments pays for Strava Metro data. So this data is collected from people that have the Strava app on their phone, which are usually recreational cyclists. Um, this is showing that this Queen Creek Wash Trail is a very well used trail. There's underpasses, it's very comfortable, we have a lot of families using it, and they're estimating this ride count of um, over 1,700 users a day. And then we see that it just ends here at, at, at Power Road. And this happens to be the border between two jurisdictions, Queen Creek and Gilbert. And so this is how the data can be used in transportation planning to identify um, where there might be a need for projects that haven't been identified before. And then when we also tie in the demographic data, and then we have that equity piece. When we look at the demographic area here, there was actually 44% of the population is either under 18 or over 65. So then we have that story and that case for improvements. And this is an active transportation case. So it's not really even so much adding technology, but it's using the technology and the big data to identify issues, prioritize issues, and then um, come up with those solutions. So my next question to you all, um, because I wanna transition into kind of the COVID-19 disruptions is how comfortable are you using shared transportation right now? Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, has 
been here for a few months. Um, it, it, it may vary in whatever region you're in, but I'm curious to know your personal comfort level in using these options. And we recognize that the comfort level is, is, is going to always be changing depending on the different policies or procedures and different air, uh, with different airlines or even with public transportation and requiring mask usage. So we're just talking about right now under, the, under what we know today. And this is, um, yeah, I'm glad you asked this question because, you know, pre-COVID we were all talking about shared mobility uh, obviously, that narrative has changed in the last many months and welcome your thoughts on how do you bring people back and get them comfortable with the shared mobility option, but do it in a responsible and equitable way. Um, and and that, that's not easy, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I love the idea of shared micromobility um, and, but I I personally think that it it takes a specific place to work well. And that place either has really high tourism or is a really large city. I'm seeing here in Arizona in more affluent communities like Scottsdale and Gilbert, I'm just seeing people purchase their own devices and, 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 and use them, which is also great that they have those devices at, and are choosing to use them over vehicles. So I, so I think that it's still up in the air, kind of the future of the shared micromobility, um, especially as the device pricing comes down and people start buying them for themselves um, versus the subscription model. But I think- And, and for the underserved communities, what, what are your thoughts on that? What was that, Chris? I'm sorry, and for the underserved communities who don't have resource, how do we, how do we get them confident back into using some of these forms of transportation that um, maybe they're not as comfortable with because of the COVID backdrop? Yeah, I think that overall with the equity side of things and the underserved communities, we are, we are always going to have the issue of the digital divide. And one of the things that has kind of, kind of risen to the top of a lot of the equity conversations is to make sure that there's some kind of kiosk available for for people that are um, like unbanked and 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 don't use a, a smartphone and I'm not aware of that actually being available for a lot of the shared micro mobility so we already kind of see that um, that void of the mic the shared micro micro mobility not really being provided to the underserved areas but for the bus and light rail and ride share I think it's still going to be an important component to their lives and hopefully make it affordable. And eventually there has to be some kind of shift to incentivize um, you know, people not using their personal vehicles, or perhaps I think the investment in active transportation will just be a lot more affordable for individuals um, that can't afford a, a, a car to make sure that they have safe transportation options because a bicycle is far less expensive than a, than a vehicle. Right. Thank you for answering this question, guys. Um, interesting that a lot of people would use the shared micromobility, I guess, because we can control and clean it ourselves. <laughs> it's probably one of the reasons. Um, and I'm also interested about the bus versus light rail, because uh, I I feel like we may, maybe the light the light rail actually could have um, you don't have to open doors and things like that or not as many things to touch. That's kind of an interesting to see everyone's view on that. So now into other disruptions, and these are completely my opinions and um, kind of predictions for what's going to happen. And feel free to chime in if anyone wants to in the chat on on whether you agree or disagree with the things that I'm gonna say. Um, 
But let's talk about freight and goods movement. I think this is one area that we kind of just, just ignored and just assumed that was going well prior to COVID-19. And then COVID-19 hits and we're all staying at home. And now it becomes a very important core form of transportation that we're all relying on to make sure that our grocery stores are stocked, that we can get supplies delivered straight to our front door. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of uh, greater emphasis or appreciation for our freight and goods movement. And on the top left, this is actually a picture of um, a Nikola truck, which is an um, it uses alternate fuels. And so we're going to, I think we're going to see a lot of investment in freight and goods movement, both with autonomous vehicles and then the environmental sustainability side of things, trying to get away from the fossil fuels. And then when we, when we talk about transit, we always are struggling with the transportation demand management, right? Trying to get people out of those single occupancy vehicles. And so how much of the telecommuting is here to stay? So me and my company have always been able to work remotely and kind of built on modern technology. There's a lot of companies that just didn't think it could work, that did not want to have their people outside of their offices. But now that we're all forced to do so, people are changing their minds. Nationwide is consolidating and closing down their offices because their remote working is working for them. So how much of that is, is here to stay and how much is that of, of that is going to affect our transportation network? I think it might affect our transportation volumes by 10% um, or more permanently. Will we see people moving to areas with a lower cost of living? You know, people that, that work in those high tech places on the West Coast, with high cost of living or even in cities on the East Coast as well, are they gonna move away from the cities because they no longer have to commute into work because they have that remote work option? And then how many companies are, are gonna remain like eight to five? We saw that with the shift to everyone working from home, there was a, there was a lot of strain on bandwidth and um, access to VPN servers. And so, you know, some engineering companies implemented morning shifts and afternoon shifts uh, to kind of balance that. And then we're experiencing that right now with schools all being on board at the same time. Um, and they're doing four hours a day of, of video conferencing. Um, what, like which organizations and, 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 and how fast is the population going to recognize that, that we can flatten the commuter curve and not have those significant peaks that, you know, as traffic engineers, we're always trying to, um, to address. Uh, Young, on that point, there was an interesting story yesterday about uh, California, and particularly the Bay Area, where people are, with the COVID backdrop and the challenge with affordable housing, people are migrating out of the area. Um, kind of curious from a city planner, design engineer, do you see this as a, a temporary thing or perhaps a permanent thing and how that might change the design and, and look of what cities are today and what they might look like in the future? I think as long as internet can get deployed to more of the rural areas, I think this is going to be more permanent. People are, are going to make their choices, you know, based on where they can work, live, go to school. And so I think a lot of us were, were tied to, okay, we want to live close to work because we want to save that time. Well, now we're all saving that commute time. And now that we have a taste of it, you know, there's a lot of people that don't want to lose that and they don't want to sit in traffic all day. So they're going to have to, so, 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 so they're going to put a lot of pressure on employers. And then in terms of California residents, I think we're already seeing that in Arizona, especially in Northern Arizona. Uh, for example, there are thousands of rooftops being built in the Prescott area, um, and we're seeing a lot of influx of new residents. And I don't think that's just retirees. I, you know, I think that is because of the ability to remote work and, you know, kind of be displaced from, um, from, from where our central office location is. Because if people don't have to go to meetings or, you know, maybe meet in person, there's a lot less reason to have to stay close to where they are. I do have a, qu a question uh, from one member of our audience. I did want to make sure we 
get in here is um, particularly people who are moving into small towns. Um, one of the questions that came up is how, how do small towns, you talked earlier about privacy of data, how do small towns uh, maintain privacy and do you have recommendations and resources for how those smaller communities provide the same level of assurance that perhaps the bigger cities would? Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of even small communities being very, um, like, have similar capabilities and technology as bigger communities. And in some sense, they have more control over it. And on a smaller scale, it's easier to manage. So I'll, I'll just take from my own personal experience as a small company is that we um, we leverage outside third party consultants to help us with cybersecurity or with geographic informational systems. So I see for smaller communities, if they do want to tackle it themselves, that they should ask for help from people that have that capability or they can group together and maybe work under an MPO or a county or at the state level to have um, common policies and regulations for that. Great advice. And so we're also seeing in the transit side of things, a shift from people using transit. And we're actually seeing this shift from people using transit to bicycling, which I'm gonna talk about on the next slide. And then carpooling is also one of those options where, you know, people may not want to do that as well. And we have stories during COVID-19 of Midwest towns where they're working in, in meatpacking factories and they're wearing all their protective gear in the meatpacking factory, but there's COVID-19 spread due to people carpooling or going out in the community and not being as cautious. So I think that it's gonna be interesting how people get comfortable with new modes of transportation um, in the future. And I think we are gonna see some of the shift but hopefully we'll still get people that, that will go back to transit. But again, if they can work from home versus having to take transit or even their own vehicle, I think that's gonna just be a, a disruptor all in all. And then we're also seeing a sudden change in revenue for transportation projects. You know, tra transportation revenue comes from gas tax or VMT tax. We have, you know, funds coming from Fed tax, sales tax, and COVID-19 has certainly disrupted that for those few months. But it's really interesting, you know, being from the town of Gilbert, um, it was interesting to see the budget numbers come in and we didn't really see a hit. We actually saw an increase in revenue from the same time last year. But that's pretty easily explained by the fact that in Gilbert, we're where most people live. And so if we're working from home, we're now spending our money closer to home. We're going to our grocery stores closer to home. We're having lunches out or ordering delivery uh, from the restaurants close to our home versus areas like Scottsdale and Phoenix, which are importers of um, employer employees. And so they lost a lot of revenue from that. Um, also Scottsdale lost a lot of tourism revenue, things like that. So it's gonna be interesting to see who are the big winners in terms of the revenue aspects, but I think we're gonna see it being the bedroom communities or where people are living versus where they're working. And we're also gonna see communities that either use cash or um, general obligation bonds for projects, you know, also have less variability in their project completion where a lot of agencies that might've been using that sales tax revenue um, could see some reduction in projects or rearranging of their programming. And so during COVID-19, we've seen this huge boom in bicycle sales. And it's been the biggest spike since the oil crisis in the 1970s. But the U.S. relies on China for over 90% of our bicycles, where the production was shut down due to the coronavirus. Um, but around the world, people are looking for alternate ways to travel versus buses and subways. People were unable to go to their gyms for exercise. And then, you know, me with my kids, 
we're stuck at home. We were so thankful that our weather was good here in Arizona in April and took advantage and went on lots of bike rides. Um, my, in my company, we actually had an April bike month challenge where our 13 employees rode a cumulative 2,100 miles. And my husband, Keith, was the winner, uh, got 400 miles in. And so that was one of the, one of the positives. But I think this is going to be something, hopefully, that, that stays in terms of people recognizing bicycling as a valid mode of transportation and then recognizing the environmental benefits, the health benefits, and communities investing in that infrastructure. It's a fraction of the cost of vehicular infrastructure, but we still haven't had that mass shift in, um, in thought from a lot of our local leaders um, in certain communities. So I'm hoping to see this be really successful. And then we saw some communities um, go to slow streets. So they actually closed some streets uh, down so that there was more space for people to walk and bike. And we're seeing that depending on the weather in certain areas, um, I think that's gonna be implemented. So I think that that might come to Arizona in the fall because it's a little bit too early to react to um, in the spring, but that might come to us in the fall where we're gonna get some requests or agencies are, are, are going to get requests from their residents to see these slow streets, which is pictured on the top left. And in the top um, right, we have, this is Larimer Square in Denver that has been closed down um, temporarily to allow restaurants to open back up into the street and provide for social distancing. So again, they have good weather. So this is, um, this is, the, this is an option for them right now. And then their community painted this beautiful mural. And now they actually want to try to get permanent closure of this street because they see the benefits of having only pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Because again, we want to be people oriented. People spend money at, at shops. People spend money in restaurants. And if we take all that space and use it for cars, we're actually limiting the number of people. Young, uh, a related question on this. Uh, so if you think about bike trails and things that span probably larger locations or geographies, um, kind of a related question. So when you're implementing smart city technology, how do you respect city borders and do the borders of the city kind of hinder or, or enable some of these projects? What, what are your thoughts on that? So that if it's a scenario where it's a bike trail that starts on the city core and sp spreads to a farther location, does that play a role in some of these projects in your mind? I think it certainly plays a role in the jurisdictions. And we have to recognize that people don't care about boundaries and a lot of our boundaries bleed together. And so again, I think smart cities is all about collaboration. And we and that is that takes a whole new perspective in terms of innovative management and leadership to collaborate across boundaries and kind of not have um, not have full autonomy, I guess, of that organization, but to really work together to improve the experience for people in the community, uh, no matter where they reside or where they're from. But we have to recognize that that is going to be a major challenge. Um, and so we can simply probably just look to those agencies to set some good examples and to implement that technology. And, and that's going to also come to the MPO level or a county level for some regional planning. Um, and so we're really fortunate in Arizona and the Phoenix area that um, MAG is a great MPO in terms of stepping up and being really active in um, safe routes to school planning, safety planning, active transportation planning and funding, uh, preliminary planning and design. So I think that those are good examples of things that, that, that work, but also once once we have some communities start building it and providing it, just like with the with just like with the slow streets, once we, once the word gets out, people are, are going to start asking, "Why can't I have that? Or why can't this be for my community?" And it'll eventually get to their leadership. But again, we need a lot of collaboration. We need to recognize that um, that that jurisdictional boundaries are really important, and we often see them as barriers or issues and it it, 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 it it shouldn't be that difficult to overcome them but it does take partnerships intergovernmental agreements and uh, the ability to work together for the common good great 
Thank you. So that's the end of my presentation. I wanted to open it up to any kind of questions. Um, I'm not going to use this platform. So if you put any questions into Zoom, uh, Chris will facilitate the Q&A for us at the end here. Uh, I, I do have another question. So it, it, within uh, the city that you're a councilwoman for, um, and I guess other neighboring cities, which smart city projects do you think are showing the most promise for transformation of how cities are designed and will provide the most good to the, the broader public collectively? That's a really good question. I think we have to recognize that if communities are really serious about smart cities and implementing smart city initiatives, they have to set a really good foundation. So in the, the town of Gilbert, for example, they've established a really great um, open data portal where they're sharing a lot of their data. They also have an incredible digital team that does a lot of public engagement. And that's pretty unheard of on the public agency side in terms of it's not quite widespread. And I'd really like to see that come across as well because we need that communication, that two-way contact between people and our governments, which sometimes are simply ignored uh, if people don't, don't find value in being part of the civic process. But then we're also seeing that there's a recognition that before we can really implement any kind of technology, we need the communications. And the communications is on a backbone of fiber, uh, 5G, we need broadband internet in order to really make a lot of the solutions or the technology viable. But again, we have to think about the end outcomes that we want for our people. So not just thinking about the technology side of things, but also thinking how else can we use big data? How else can we achieve our environmental sustainability initiatives um, through these projects and then communicate that with, with the residents to ensure that they understand the benefits and that they're on board with that and that they trust what's being done. And on a related note, how, so how do you communicate the health and safety benefits of 5G connectivity, for example, um, and kind of steering away from perhaps some thoughts that I am opening myself up to privacy concerns. How do you strike that balance between those two? Yeah, I think we see it first being implemented and used um, for the departments that the agency controls. So the fleet services with um, waste and recycling, with emergency response, we're going to see it with fire and EMS service. And once we see the benefits or, or communicate how this is benefiting the public or even transit signal priority, which, which we already have in a lot of areas, once it becomes that commonplace, then I think you would start to recognize what other benefits there are. So for example, um, this doesn't have to do specifically with 5G, but Audi, approached City of Mesa and said, hey, can we get information from your traffic signal so that our vehicles have an in-vehicle in countdown for when the traffic light is going to change? And they have that established already. Um, so a lot of the technology can be done now. It's just not at a level where it can be used for things that are life safety purposes. So autonomous vehicles, um, or the infrastructure to vehicle communications. I mean, those are like milliseconds in terms of the accuracy that is needed before it can be really be implemented um, widely. There's no room for error for those types of implementations. So I think we're actually gonna see a lot more of the implementation on the private sector side for things that aren't life safety related. Um, and, then, and then we're gonna get that adoption of technology from, from generations to come. Uh, and if anybody else has uh, questions, by all means, let us know through the Zoom chat. Happy to, to facilitate those. Um, another question that came up, uh, Young, is how would you describe the information sharing 
between your city and other cities in Arizona, and even more broadly uh, across the U.S. of best practices, things that you're seeing, as smart city innovations that you're trying to bring into your uh, either your design side of your life or your city council side of life? How does that process playing out? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it, it really varies from community to community, from state to state. So I'll just give a couple of examples from the Phoenix metro region that I'm familiar with. We have a very strong um, collaboration environment related to intelligent transportation systems that started in the 90s with the formation of um, regional collaboration for intelligent transportation. So we actually have a regional communication network that's now housed in MAG that was housed with ADOT where um, all of the agencies in the area can actually access each other's um, equipment for on their traffic signals. They can't operate like a camera to make it move, but they can view what the camera is viewing, things like that. And that really helps in terms of when they have construction activities on the border of jurisdictions and one community has a better view of another. Um, we're seeing ADOT, you know, installing the wrong way detection um, technology, which is all automated in terms of once a wrong way vehicle is detected, there's no human intervention. It just automatically pulls up on all of the traffic management center screens. So that kind of automation is really important because it saves time. Um, DPS is located right um, with uh, ADOT and their traffic management and they're the Department of, of Public Safety. And that has helped tremendously in getting incidents cleared and there's been a, a big benefit in that. In terms of Gilbert and data sharing, um, you know, I think currently they just have the, their open data portal. And what, 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 what we're going to see is some communities, I think like Gilbert, creating some of the standards and procedures and policies that others may want to adopt. Mm -hmm. uh, then we're also going to see things like a project that I worked with Gilbert on is, or that my team did, was to connect their police department crash data directly into a portal so they could analyze crashes in real time because before it was just the agency police departments would send their crash data to the state the state would have to enter it into their system and then it wouldn't come back down to the agencies for six to 18 months and so wow. to bypass that system you know we use technology and modern platforms to help with that and i think we're going to see a lot more of that come into play with the data analytics and dashboards that's going to kind of explode in the next couple of years that's just going to help make decisions just quicker and faster because we'll have a better baseline of what's really happening not just the perception of what might be happening and as we move to the brave world of autonomous transportation that time lag is going to have to obviously compress significantly yeah, autonomous transportation is super interesting to follow because it's ever changing and evolving. And when, when people started tackling autonomous transportation, they started tackling the most challenging problem, and that is a basic city driver. And I think what they're recognizing is that it's an incredibly challenging problem that they cannot fix especially when it comes to different weather conditions. So here in Arizona, we have a ton of autonomous vehicles, but we have grid streets and our weather is usually very good. Um, and we aren't seeing a lot of rapid expansion. So I think autonomous transportation is going to really move towards fleet vehicles in terms of trucking um, and, and, and fixed route transit, I think those are actually better options for autonomous vehicles because it gives a much limited scope of, of what that vehicle has to operate within. Great. Young, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your overview and your input today. Uh, I know we're coming to the top of the hour and uh, I, I just wanna thank everybody for joining our webinar this afternoon, or this morning. 
Um, we are going to have our next uh, webinar kickoff on September 10th, uh, 10 a.m. And we'll be having uh, our next guest is going to be Tom Sahar from the state of Arizona, who will be talking about the future of electrification and transportation in the Southwest. So I recommend if you can uh, join us for that discussion. Love to have you. And again, on behalf of ACT and the Valley of the Sun chapter, Young, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. And have everybody have a great morning.